Hello friends, welcome back to this 8th lecture on the course on consumer psychology. Now, up till the 7th previous lectures, we will be looking at what is consumer behavior and the process through which consumer makes decisions. So, the consumer decision making process. And the model that we use for discussing this consumer decision making process was the EKB model. It is a very popular model. So, uh, in the previous lectures, we are focusing on those aspects which the consumer takes into account while in the marketplace and selecting between different products which are out there. So, we looked at how does the consumer go inside the marketplace, how does he know that he has a need for a particular product, how does the need arousal come about and once he has the need of a product that I need this, how does he go about searching for information about this product. So, these are the first two steps that, that is there that we, that we discussed. In addition, we discussed that once the consumer knows that he has enough information about the product, he goes in the market, he finds a number of products which offers them similar benefits a number of benefits which are similar, a uh, lot of products, variety of products and so on and so forth. So, how does the consumer decide between what products to buy and what not to buy? So, the next step was alternate evaluation and uh, choice which we covered in uh, lesson number 5, 6 and 7. And we looked at those uh, parameters, determinants that the consumer uses to decide which product is best for him in this whole marketplace which is filled with a number of products. So, that was what the first part of this lecture was on alternate evaluation. The next we looked at is the mathematical model that the consumer uses to actually decide which product to buy. So, how does he uh, uh, do the comparison? He has some determinant attribute, he, is, he decides some parameters, but using that parameters, how does he decide is what we looked into the next lecture. So, we looked at certain um, uh, parameters for compensatory, non compensatory and so on and so forth. And after that, how does he choose the final product? That was in the seventh lectures, we looked at a number of variables which affects the consumer make a final choice of what product to buy and what not to buy. And so, we looked at not only product choices, we also looked at outlet choices and that uh, and how the consumer makes these choices and finally decides on or zooms on on particular product. Now, once that is over, once the consumer has already selected a product and uh, he uh, through alternate evaluation, he buys the product right and consumes the product. So, the topic of interest of this particular lecture will be consumption process because once a consumer has a product and he goes ahead and uses it. So, how does the consumer use this product and what are the consumption situations in which way he uses this product? What are the factors which decides this consumption? Uh, so, uh, what is satisfaction with a product? What is dissatisfaction with a product? And what is cognitive dissonance? Now, if you remember the EKB model, and since post purchase choice and consumption is not a direct part of the EKB model, because the EKB model ends with the consumer making a final decision of product buying there it ends. After that comes the consumption process because once you have bought the product, you are going to use it in some way, you are going to consume it. And once you consume the product, once you start consuming the product or interacting with the product, a whole lot of factors affect that. Not only that, a whole lot of factors affect how you consume the products, a number of situations arises out of it. And so, three probable situations that we discussed in, in the first or second lecture when we were introducing what is consumer behavior and the EKV model. And so, the, these three factors are after consumption, a consumer either gets dissatisfied, a consumer gets satisfied or the consumer gets into a state which is called a dissonance, a cognitive dissonance. And now, dissonance is a state where you believe something and you say something. So, it is a difference between what you believe and what you say and that happens because there is a change or there is a uh, slight difference between the attitude that you have about the product and the behavior that you are going to do about it. So, it is a concept in psychology which is called cognitive dissonance given by someone called Fessinger. So, three different outputs after consumption of the product. So, what we will do in this lecture, in this particular lecture is we will look into the first two parts. We will look into what is consumption how does this consumption really take place? What are the various variables which affect consumption of a product? And what are the factors that affect consumptions? The, be it a market factor or be it a consumer factor. And then we can look at 
things like what is satisfaction and dissatisfaction. So, we will cover the satisfaction and dissatisfaction part in this particular lecture that if a consumer is satisfied with the product, what happens? If it is not satisfied with the product, what happens and so on and so forth. And then later on in the next lecture, which is lecture number 9, we will look into a state which is called cognitive dissonance. This is the state when you are neither satisfied with the product nor dissatisfied with the product. So, you are in a state of cognitive dissonance where you say something and you believe something and so what happens then. And towards the end of that, we will look into uh, something called brand loyalty and those kind of uh, parameters at the end of lecture number 9. Now, this is lecture number 8 where we will only look into something called consumption, how does the consumption affect, what is the consumption process variables and we will also look into satisfaction and dissatisfaction. Now, let us take a good example of what consumption is all about. So, your friends invite you on a trip, on a trip abroad, let us say somewhere in Europe and you get all excited a school trip to, to Europe or, a, or a, um, a friend trip to Europe, very excited. So, why a lot of things? Right? So, you think it is summer and you buy a lot of things, you think that Europe is all cold and you are going towards the north of it and so what you tend to do is buy uh, those uh, blankets, warm blankets, some compasses, all kind of things, uh, some Indian food to, to buy or varieties of other things, you know all kind of packaging material or all kind of things that you take abroad because this is your first trip abroad and so you calculate, you ponder upon and buy a lot of things that you want to carry to your trip abroad. Once you go there, you realize that some of the things that you brought is of no use, right. So, some of the things you use which you take from India are there and some of the things you do not use, so you bring them back. And when you bring them back, you go to the shop. So, couple of things the shop will take back, couple of things the shop will not take back. And when you have used this product, when you have consumed the products that you have brought from the market and used in Europe, some of the things you get satisfied with it and some of the things you do not get satisfied. And for some of the things you return it, get store credit or get money, some of the things you really liked what you brought from India to abroad and then when coming back you are using that. Some of the things that you brought for example, compasses that you brought or a hot blanket that you brought, you realize that you do not need it. A lot of Indian food masalas that you brought, you took, took abroad, you really realize that you do not need that and so when you come back the store is not going to take back. So, what do you do with it? You are dissatisfied with it. And so, this is a typical consumption process. This is the typical consumption situation that we will dis discussing and that is what we will be doing in this uh, lecture. So, let us start into the uh, dwelling into the idea of what is consumption and what is post purchase behavior. So, products and service consumption. So, products and con service consumption basically what is the definition of consumption? So, consumption is the process, uh, the possession or the use of goods and services and the benefits that they deliver. So, any goods and services has certain kind of uh, benefits and when using that product, the benefits that you get from either some kind of goods that you buy or some kind of service that you buy is what is called consumption. So, acquiring that, acquiring the benefits or basically indulging in the benefits that the product has to offer is basically what is called consumption. Now, this consumption set is a mix of goods and services acquired and used. So, consumption generally speaking is not a one variable, it is not one product that you use because when you are using something, when you are using a, a product, there are other products or there are a related products that you use with it. For example, if you if, if it is laptop that I am looking at. So, it is not only the laptop that I am buying, I am also buying a mouse with it, a monitor with it, um, uh, not a monitor, a, lap, a, mouse, a mouse with external mouse, external keyboard, external hard drive. Um, USB drives, some other uh, laminations or something. So, these kind of things are things that you buy with a laptop. And so, this whole goods and services that you buy with a laptop to be used and that is called a consumption set. So, those goods and services and the benefits that you are going to use is called a consumption set. So, consumption is generally not a one product, it is a whole a range of products that you use. The other thing is consumption depends a lot upon lifestyle, consumption varies across lifestyles. And so, to take a, a typical example, let us say when you are in college or when you are in school. So, when you are in school, your consumption pattern is based on the lifestyle of a school. And so, there you are more about geometry boxes, you are more about copies, you are more about video games, Xboxes, you are more about um, board games, all kind of things. But when a lifestyle change happens, when you move out of your school or, col uh, or college and go to work 
or start working, these lifestyle will change and then the kind of products that you use also changes. So, it is no more X boxes, it is more about cars, it is no more fun and games and geometry boxes, it is about valued pens and laptops and so things change. And so, as lifestyle changes, consumption also keeps on changing. So, one of the factors that marketers have to realize or even consumers have to realize is that as lifestyle changes, consumption also changes, consumption also keeps on varying according to lifestyle. So, what are the factors which affect consumption is lifestyle and another factor which affects consumption is the culture. Now, certain culture dictates how the consumption is going to take place. For example, there are certain cultures uh, in, in the Middle East which decides what kind of clothing should women and men wear and so that decides what are you going to uh, where and what are you going to purchase or if you look into uh, uh, Japan there is a particular dress code for there and so people there use a particular which is called the kimono. So, you, you used to you have to buy those kind of dress dresses or those kind of things. So, with culture with places with different um, societies the kind of consumption also differs and so one of the variables one another variable which affects consumption is different cultures and different uh, lifestyles. So, these are the four things that we look into product and service consumption. Now, what is a consumption situation? The consumption situation is the physical and social context in which we actually you go use goods and services provided. So, once you buy a particular product we know that several factors are going to affect it, but the context in which we are going to use it the the uh, physical factors, the social factors uh, in, in the context of which or around which we are going to use the product is basically called the consumption situation or comprises of the consumption situation. So, what are the physical factors? The physical uh, context or the physical factors can be time and place of consumption. So, basically the physical context could be the time and place of the consumption. It could be what time you are consuming it, when are you consuming it, is are you consuming the product right after buying, are you consuming the product after a certain kind of a delay. So, for example, ice creams, something food material, you consume it there and then itself, but then uh, buying TVs and laptops, you just do not go there and start op opening the television set and start viewing. So, after a delay you are going to use it or gifts, you may never use it and so this timing is very important, the physical context timing and the place of consumption, where you are consuming it, it is, is it in the store that you are consuming it, is it in the uh, house that you are consuming it, is it somewhere else that you are consuming it, for example, party drinks. So, you buy a, a, a shrimp in large shrimp bottle for somebody his birthday. Now, obviously, you are not going to open it in, in your house, neither you are going to open it in the context of the store, where you are going to open it on a special day on a special location. And so, this place, the time place of where you are going to use it has a lot of meaning or decides this consumption situation. With this, the presence of others also gives uh, the consumption situation a social context. So, another factor or another uh, part of this uh, consumption situation is the social context. For example, who you are around when you are consuming it. Think of two situations, it could be that you go out with friends and you are dining and so the way you behave, the way you consume food will be entirely different from when you are going with your parents for buying, for buying food or getting food in a restaurant and so two different kind of dinner situations. In one situation it will be all haphazard, so no five course dinner, whatever you want you will order because it is friends and so it does not really have to follow in a particular manner. But with, if you are going with the parents, if you are going with a significant elder, then the five course follows right from soup to the main course to the sweet dish at the end of it and then something else and so th all those five courses that has to come will actually come across. And so, people matter right, the social context whom you are around that also matters whether it is friend and family, it is significant other, it is a friend group, your acquaintance group and so that also matters and so consumption situation is also comprised of or is basically also uh, dictated by the social context. And the next thing that uh, gives importance is the consumption episode. What is consumption episode? It is defined as the set of items belonging to the same event and occurring in the temporal contiguity. So, what do you mean by, what do I mean by this? Whenever I am buying a particular product, whenever I am using a particular product, it is not just one product that I am using, I am using 
a number of products as I, as I explained to you back to back. For example, let us take a dinner. Now, in a dinner, it is not just sweet dish that you are using, you are using soups, you are using cutleries, you are using, uh, you are smelling scents in a restaurant, you are sitting somewhere and so there are a number of products which actually comprise of the dinner and these products, the uses of these products one after another, the sitting, the environment, the situation is one factor, uh, the grill that, that is uh, uh, offering you the food, the barbecue that is offering you the food, the kind of food which is coming, the all kinds of foods, all kinds of cutlery which are there, the manner you pay, the satisfaction that you get, all of them comprises one after another. The behavior of uh, the waiter there or the store manager there and so many other things are one after another. And so, this whole one after another linkage is actually called the consumption episode. So, that is what is called the consumption episode and that is what, of, what is of interest to us. So, what can the marketer do? To influence this consumption uh, episode or consumption situation. Now, since there are a number of factors which are responsible to it or the number of factors which describe a typical consumption situation, the marketer has certain controls and they can do certain things. So, basically this consumption situation is not only defined by social factors and personal factors those kind of things. It is also defined by how much control the marketer has on this situation. So, consumption situations are also decided by market control and so in one case this is extensive market control. So, there are situations in which the marketer who is giving you the product, who is offering you the product has extensive control on what you are buying and what not. So, the marketer is present during the consumption and both watch and influence how it plays out. Take the example of a hotel stay. Now, there when you are getting that service, when you are getting that particular product to use, the service to use, the marketer or the hotel manager is in front of you, he can see what you are doing, he can correct what you are doing and so he has extensive control and so that way he can influence you. So, if you are not satisfied with something, he can come up offer you a new room, do a lot of things. So, consumption situations are also affected by what kind of market control are there and so one example, one good example is extensive market control. The next is limited market control. So, in this situation what happens is the marketers have the opportunity to watch how their products are consumed and improve or promote them accordingly, but he cannot influence in you in any way. So, there is a limited market control. Think about all those food stalls which are on wheels, an ice cream store outside a mall. All those situations, the marketer can see you buy an ice cream, but he cannot dictate you where you are going to throw it or how you are going to eat it. And so, in those cases, it is a limited market control which is of use here. So, here the marketer can actually see you use your product, buy uh, how you are buying the product and can do something to improve it, but cannot interfere in any way. They cannot dictate how you use the product. And so, another uh, next situation that we look into or uh, in terms of marketer control of how consumption situation varies is with limited market control. And the third phase is that no market control. So, these, this is another consumption situation where the marketer has no control whatsoever on what you are actually buying and this is the act of consumption takes place elsewhere. So, this is buying a laptop, buying a car, the marketer has no control whatsoever what you do with it, right. So, you can of course, if it does not work you can come back for a refund, but the marketer has no sense or no control whatsoever on what you are buying, how you are using it and what you are doing. What it can actually do is once the product is appreciated or fails, what it can uh, do is it can, it can gi he can give you a replacement. So, how, how do they study this in no market control, how does the marketer study how you are using the product? What it does is it just believes that certain kind of information which is given to you that is enough. More so ever what it can do is it can actually ask post purchase questions to you right or maybe uh, ask you to bring the car back after a certain period of time for examination. That is the best control that they can do. Other than that, they have no say whatsoever on how you are using the product, what is the way you are interacting with it and how you are defining or consuming the product. Now, the consumption itself, the number of types of consumption and so we will see some primary types of consumptions. One of the primary type of consumption is called ritualistic consumption or ritual consumption. Now, what is ritual consumption? Let us look have a look at it. So, consumption of goods and services that is tied to a specific ritual. 
So, when a consumption of a particular product or uh, a service is tied to a particular ritual that kind of a ritual or that kind of a consumption is called ritualistic consumption. And so, uh, for example, a ritual could be a marriage right or someone's death and so these are rituals which are there which, which are in the society and so the rituals may be kind of periodic occurring or it could be once in a while occurring. So, marriage is something which happens once in a while right until and unless you go ahead and marry a number of times that is not going to happen right. So, that, that kind of a thing. So, on the other hand it could be a periodic thing for example, birthday is an anniversary. So, which there is a certain ritual to it right and so let us for that purpose let us understand what a ritual is. So, what are rituals these are patterns of behavior. So, ritual is actually a pattern of behavior how the consumer is actually going to behave which is tied to events that we consider important in our lives right. So, look at marriages what do we do? In a marriage, the purchases in a marriage, the consumption in a marriage can vary from buying the wedding ring to buying the wedding gown to uh, booking the honeymoon uh, trip to booking uh, the best hotel to uh, looking for how to arrange the uh, ceremony itself to uh, addressing number of friends to looking at gifts and so many other things. So, so many purchases one after another, but this happens one in your lifetime and so this is a ritual the marriage has a particular ritual which basically means that is a pattern of behavior which is very specific to the events that are important to us. And so, and more more so ever these rituals are similar to many people right. Of course, across cultures as I said that consumption differs across cultures, but within cultures it will have the same marriage. So, a marriage in India is entirely different from a marriage which is happening somewhere in the west, but the kind of pattern of behavior which is going to happen there is more or less the same and that is what we call as ritualistic consumption or that is what we call as a ritual. So, what is important then why uh, what is important outline for, from the ritualistic consumption of the marketer the thing here is that it is important for the marketer to understand rituals and the behaviors they give rise to. Now, once a marketer is able to understand the ritualistic consumption that people one of the ways in which people do consumption is ritualistic once the marketer understands that and also understands the kind of behavior that he is going to do he can promote his product. For example, there are a uh, couple of companies which actually only cater to birthdays there are companies which cater to uh, weddings right. And so, the marketer there the product offerer there has to understand in which way this ritual is going to happen and that way he can promote his particular product particular service or particular uh, pr uh, product benefits out of it. So, one particular way of looking at consumption is called ritualistic consumption. The next kind of consumption that takes place is called the sacred and profane consumption. So, what is the sacred and profane consumption? Sacred consumption is tied to holidays and rites of passage. What does it mean? Sacred consumptions are those consumptions which occur once in a while right. So, your holiday going, weddings or uh, anniversaries, birthdays these are sacred con consumption because they have a sacred sacralistic meaning to them right. On the other hand, so some marketers give rise to the term a broad application covering any object, place, behavior, days and seasons that have special meaning to any individual or group of individuals. So, this sacred consumption uh, this is how the some, some marketers actually define uh, sacred consumption they, they, they believe sacred consumption is basically applicable to objects, places, behaviors, days or seasons uh, that have special meaning to any individual behavior. So, sacred consumption is that type of consumption where events happen once in a while in a repetitive manner maybe not in a repetitive manner and so on and so forth. On the other hand there is another kind of consumption which is called the profane consumption. And so, what are profane consumption? It is a part of everyday life, everyday consumptions are profane consumption. So, on one hand I have sacred consumptions which are anniversaries, birthdays or holidays right. So, buying for those and so there is a very special meaning very special way of buying for it very special technique of buying for it the feeling differs everything differs into it. On the other hand I have profane consumption it is like everyday buying everyday fruits buying everyday vegetable buying everyday bread buying that kind of thing is a profane consumption. So, so that is the distinction between these two type of consumptions which are there and this this process of sacralization is also varying as cultures are changing. 
So, as cultures and other social groups change over time, the process of desacralization, losing sacred status or sacralization, gaining sacred status happen. So, this sacred consumption, how a profane consumption becomes a sacred consumption or a sacred consumption becomes a profane consumption or the process of desacralization and sacralization happens because uh, the market has to realize that because cultures change. Let us take an example of desacralization. So, remember souvenirs. Long back, not too long back, when somebody used to go abroad, we will ask them to bring or we used to ask them to bring souvenirs. And these souvenirs had actually a great meaning. They were sacred because that represented our whole idea of what that place is. And remember those Eiffel Towers from uh, Paris, which you would request from anyone who goes to Paris to bring it back. right? And that has special meaning to us. But with the opening of the market, what has happened is these particular Eiffel Towers are sold everywhere. And so, that sacred meaning which was attached to the fact with this particular Eiffel Tower which you buy out of Paris and then you gift it to a friend, that has changed over the period of time. Now, it is no more sacred. Or the Jews cross. The cross is something which is meant to represent a, a, a particular religion or a particular religious faith. But nowadays, you see it printed everywhere. Right? On t-shirts, people wear it on the ear and, and all kinds of things. Right? So, the secularized meaning, the typical meaning that it had, the, the secrecy that it had or the speciality that it had, the special meaning which was attached to it is now being divulged. It could also happen to events. Let us look at special events. For example, let us take the Hindu Holi. Now, that was in, in the time when internet and, and, and flights, cheap, uh, cheap flight tickets and those things were not there. Holi was a situation where people would come from different places, meet and respect each other and so on and so forth. But with the coming of so many products, so many product types, so variations in societies, variation in cultures, Holi is no more that important. Why? Because it is not important. Holi, it had a different meaning. It had a meaning of people coming together and enjoying. It is no more there. The meaning of color, the meaning of people meeting over a large period of time since they could not communicate with each other. So, when they come together, they communicate. Right? Those days when letters were sent and it took time for people to write letters. Now is the day of apps which can send in messages within seconds to people. People remain connected all the time. People, you watch people having smartphones and they are communicating all the time. So, what is the need for this Holi and Diwali? And so, the, the sacralization of these holidays actually is not desacralized. Similarly, at times products which are profane become sacralized. Right? Things that were, were profane at one point of time, they become desacralized. And examples are the dress that Bapu used to wear, Gandhiji used to wear. So, when he was wearing it is a simple khadi and now what has it become? It has become the symbol of something, a sacralization happened. It has raised in its meaning and people believe it to be different or the, the footstep of some uh, great uh, freedom fighter or something like that which was very natural at that point of time has now become sacred and so it, this has attained a different meaning altogether. And so, this whole process of desacralization and sacralization keep on happening in society. What the marketer has to do is to understand how these processes are, these underlying processes are going on and if they do that only then are they going to understand the market and understand this consumption process of how the people are consuming and what are the different type of consumer cons uh, consumptions which are happening in the market. Because once they, they understand that, once they understand how the consumption is going on, they can improve their product or they can do something. So, the best benefits can be offered to the people and more products can be sold, they get the best profit out of it. And the third kind of consumption that we look at is called compulsive consumption. So, what is this consumption? In this consumption, what really happens is that people buy products just for satisfying their ego. So, a response basically con the compulsive com uh, consumption, the definition which is given here is the response to an uncontrollable drive or desire to obtain, use or experience a feeling of substance, of a feeling, substance or an activity that leads the individual to repeatedly engage in behavior that will ultimately cause harm to the individual or other behavior. So, basically compulsive consumption is basically buying something for the satisfying their ego. So, we are not interested in the utility of the product, but you buy it, you acquire that thing, right. Since you have money, you buy it, right. Uh, you are buying something just for the buying purpose of it. 
not using it as such and so that is called compulsive consumption or you see a new product and you jump onto it and you buy it and you hoard products and that kind of consumption situation or consumptions are called compulsive consumptions. Now, what kind of people go into compulsive consumptions? Generally, the family has a large place part to play in compulsive consumptions. For example, from families which have alcohol use or other forms of substance abuse, physically involved violence, divorce, separations, single parents or other emotional uh, conflicts, these are the same kind of people who actually have these problems with. So, so who, who actually uh, uh, go ahead and which kind of consumers actually so compulsive consumption, these are the same people who actually go through this kind of family processes uh, either uh, suffering a divorce or have had a uh, specific episode of abuse of alcohol or maybe have some kind of an emotional conflict. And so, this is the third type of consumption which is out there. So, once the consumer and the marketer understands what is consumption or how consumption is done, the output of it is something called satisfaction or dissatisfaction. If and then there is something called uh, cognitive dissonance, but dissonance as I said will take up into another lecture. So, in this lecture we will only be focusing on something called satisfaction and dissatisfaction. So, satisfaction is that part where the, con uh, the consumer uses a product, likes a product and basically promises or uh, him to himself or the marketer to use it again. On the other hand, dissatisfaction is when you do not like a product, you have used it and somehow it has not matched up to expectation and you think of product switching maybe or changing the product type, category or so on and so forth. So, basically consumption affects consumer satisfaction. The way you consume a product, it has a lot to do with what is consumer satisfaction. So, what is satisfaction? Consumer satisfaction. Consumer satisfaction is the key to long term relationships between the marketer and the consumer. And so, once as I said a consumer is satisfied with a product a long time partnership is evolved or a long time loyalty is evolved between the uh, consumer and the manufacturer of the product. And this relationship at the center of it has benefits to both the buyer and seller. So, why is this relationship established between the consumer and the marketer? This relationship is established because it is a mutually benefiting partnership. The consumer gets the benefit that he wants, the buyer or the manufacturer gets the profit that he wants and so it is equivalent and so it is balanced on both the sides. And so, satisfaction is one rule which balances this kind of an equation. Now, if we are happy with a particular product or service purchase, we are likely to buy it again and that is very sure. If we are actually liking a product, we are very sure to buy. Now, there is a caveat here or uh, there is there is a unfolding that I want to do here. Understand that if you buy a high involvement product and even if the satisfaction level is high, you may not think of getting brand loyal or getting to buy it. But if a low involvement product gives you more satisfaction, the chances are very high that you become brand loyal, you want to buy it again and again and you want to use it again and again from the same manufacturer in the same way that is consumed. So, that is uh, the little rider here, the little remark that I have here. Right? So, of course, when you are happy with a product or service that you have purchased, you become more likely to use that service. And so, using of avatars has a positive effect and so, marketers who use avatars, who use this kind of a 3D kind of a profile uh, to, to influence marketers using of these 3D profiles of what it looks like and that, that uh, or what a con typical consumer would look like would actually help consumer having more positive effect of their product. So, let us discuss satisfaction versus dissatisfaction. What is satisfaction and what is dissatisfaction? So, level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction we experience depends on the perceived difference between. So, what is the difference between what we call as expectation and what we call as realization. Right point the point of time that you have a need arose, and then you do the search in the market, do the alternate evaluation, get the final choice and actually approach the product to buy it. You have certain expectations from the product, right? So, you want certain benefits to be delivered to you and these expectations are there. When you use the product, these uh, expectation may turn out to be true or not true. So, how much realization, how much yield the product after using, after consuming a product, how much yield is it outputting and how close it is to what you wanted. So, the difference between 
your expectation, expected performance that you wanted and the actual or perceived performance that you are getting is what is called the level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction decides. So, satisfaction or dissatisfaction is equivalent to expected performance minus expected or perceive, perceived or actual performance right. So, that is the difference between expectation and realization and that defines that defines what is satisfaction or dissatisfaction that you have after consuming a product. So, satisfaction means different things to different people. Now, this idea of satisfaction is very difficult. It is very difficult to define what is satisfaction. The reason is satisfaction is not an easy word to define. How do you define satisfaction and why it is not easy to define? The one reason why satisfaction is not easy to define is because different people have different meanings of satisfaction. They have their own determinants, they have their own characteristics, they have their own parameters. For some people 5 unit or 5 characteristics in a product, 5 uh, product benefits that you get out of a product is called satisfaction. For other people 2 product benefits into the product is satisfaction. For some people 11 benefits are still not satisfaction and so levels vary and this typical uh, is, is this typicality is what is uh, the basis of psychophysics. In psychophysics what we tend to do is we measure how somebody says uh, or this, this particular thing is also the basis of not only psychophysics but in signal detection. In signal detection theories we tend to look at something called uh, criteria, criteria of, uh, uh, of, of people to say yes and no to incoming signals. And so, this criteria which is called which is represented by beta naught in, in classical psychophysics that is what we are talking about here, this difference uh, things or different people. So, this criteria is different right and, and so, different people have different criteria or different amount of uh, 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 fulfillment that they get and this fulfillment will actually translate to satisfaction. One's level of satisfaction can change for better or worse over time. Now, one thing that can hap happen is that the satisfaction level, why it is different from different people because it could happen that the satisfaction level can change for better or worse over time. As time progresses your satisfaction level may change, uh, may keep on changing. One of those people who, uh, so as a child something that you wanted to buy, you, uh, you desired more out of it and so your satisfaction level was very high at that point of time, but, the, but as you progress you realize that the, 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 the in, in natural settings ideal products are not there and so you take it for granted that only 5 characteristics, 5 parameters it offers uh, and that is going to be uh, how a product is going to behave and so your satisfaction level changes. So, for example, let us take shoes. Now, shoes when you buy when you are a small kid and you buy a bought a shoe that you wanted everything from it style, design, this, that all kind of things. But as you progress the same shoe, the same brand and you realize that it is not meeting your expectation. But as time passed and you realize that wearing after so many brands that this is the only brand which is there, but even if it lacks what is happening is over a period you realize that okay, whatever 5 it is offering still it is worthwhile and that is how satisfaction level differs. So, initially you wanted everything in it, as time progresses you believe that only 5 is okay because other brands are still not fulfilling this and this is what is how satisfaction varies over time. Also satisfactions can change when consumers need and preferences change. Also as things change, as your requirement change, as your needs change or your preferences change, satisfaction level can also keep on changing, right. It, can, it could be as simple as eating. So, as with uh, as you grow old you turn from more about pizzas and burgers to more healthy food and so as you keep on changing the satisfaction level also keeps on changing. At one point of time when you were small you e eating pizzas and burgers, taste was of more importance as you go ahead in time as your preferences changes as you grow older what would happen is your preferences is to, to more, more vegetable food, healthy food and so taste is not that much of a matter for you and so preference keeps on changing. And so, with changes in lifestyle with changes in needs and preferences also these satisfaction level keeps on changing. So, there also appears to be a social dimension to satisfaction and what is this social dimension that I am talking about this social dimension which I have here what does it really mean. Satisfaction is not only your satisfaction, suppose you bring a product to your home. Now, you will only be satisfied or you will be more satisfied if people approve you on that particular product. 
that subtraction level will be more. So, if you bring a TV to your home and so everybody uh, just for the sake of it is saying it is very good, but they are not satisfied with it, you are not satisfied with it. But with people around you, with friends, families, other people, when they like your product, when they like the consumption of your product, when, when you bring a product and they interact with it and they like it, that adds on to your satisfaction and so it has a social dimension and that is what is called the social motive or the social factor which affects on to satisfaction. So, satisfaction is not an easy term to look at, these are some of the factors which affect satisfaction. There are three components of satisfaction, what is this one is called the, the first is that there is satisfaction is mainly a primary emotional con, uh, uh, a primary emotional concept although sometimes it is cognitive in nature. Whenever you think about satisfaction, whenever you say you are satisfied with the product, what do you do? Great, good, excellent, these are verbs, these are words which you actually use to describe satisfaction and so mostly these words are all emotive words, they have emotions behind it. At times uh, it is also cognitive in nature where you, where you define it is risk free kind of a thing or it is patient or, or it is uh, some other word cognitive word to express it thought process. So, it is well th the product is well thought of suppose supposedly you say. So, that is the cognitive component when you are expressing, but mostly when you actually look at a product and we are satisfied with it the words emotional words come on to big and it is mo mostly the feeling associated with the product which expresses satisfaction and so it is wow how a product looks like excellent brilliant uh, amazing are the words and that is how satisfaction is defined. So, consumer satisfaction is generally an emotional thing although at times it is also cognitive. Mainly the satisfaction response when you are satisfied with a particular product you do a particular behavior out of it and this response is having a particular focus of object. So, satisfaction is not generally speaking is not with the whole product as, uh, as such, the whole experience as such it is with a particular, uh, it has a particular focus. So, be it the product itself that you are satisfied with, its consumption, the purchase decision, the sales person, the store, uh, the store, the acquisition or so on and so forth. So, let us say you are buying a new camera, it could be that using the camera is giving you satisfaction or at times it is the store from you where, where you brought it actually made you more satisfied or it could, the store, it could be the store person or the process of acquiring it made gave you more satisfaction where they came to your house delivered it and the process itself was more satisfactory. So, the response of satisfaction is basically has a particular focus right. So, it could be it could be that the whole product itself is giving you the satisfaction or parts of it is giving to satisfaction and so this is one of the response of satisfaction which is there. And there is the third component which is the timing of the response when is the response given a satisfaction. You could just be satisfied by looking at a product or you could be uh, uh, satisfied while you were interacting with consuming the product or you get satisfied after consumption of the product. And so, which process in the consumption of a product is or what time you actually got satisfied is of importance. So, timing of the response is also important in satisfaction uh, guaranteeing satisfaction and so over these are one of the three components of satisfaction. So, what is the relationship between expectation and satisfaction? Expectancy disconfirmation is a state which is happens which comes around if realization which is the actual or perceived performance in terms of possession and use does not match the expectation. So, satisfaction what is the relation between satisfaction and expectation what you expect and what you uh, and how that relates to uh, the satisfaction is basically outlined by three or four uh, different uh, parameters or three or four different uh, concepts. And so, one concept is called expectancy discount. Uh, so, how closely you are satisfied with a product in terms of your expectation. So, how closely the realization of the product gives you satisfaction and the expectation that you have that is defined by three or four concepts or three or four different parameters and one parameter is called expectancy disconfirmation. And so, what is expectancy disconfirmation? This is when the realization actual or perceived in terms of possession and or use does not match expectation. So, once you use a product and you are not satisfied with it at all this is called expectancy disconfirmation you are not satisfied with it that is called expectancy disconfirmation, but and this is called unsatisfaction or not satisfaction or uh, unsatisfied kind of a thing. But 
within satisfaction also we have certain categories. So, within satisfaction we can have simple confirmation satisfaction and what is called simple confirmation satisfaction in this case the purchase performance per, uh, the purchase product performs as expected resulting in expectation. So, you bought a pair of shoes and you believe that it is going to give you comfort and the pair of shoes is actually offering you comfort. This is called expected simple confirmation satisfaction. The next kind within it is called positive disconfirmation and what when does positive disconfirmation happens occurs when performance is better than expected leading to higher levels of satisfaction. So, you brought a new camera you expected it to work in a certain way, but wh what when you started using it you realize that it has out of focus in it, it has out of styles in it, it has a Wi-Fi in it, it has so many other things that you always thought you wanted, but when you were considering the product you actually never considered these features into buying it and so when these factors are there when the product actually performs better than what you wanted to it better better uh, satisfaction levels that is called positive disconfirmation. There is another one that that is here which is called a negative disconfirmation and so what is negative disconfirmation a negative confirmation disconfirmation is when the purchase falls short of expectation. So, you buy the product you have certain expectation it falls below it, but you are still using it. Remember in expectancy disconfirmation what happens is that you do not use the product you are not satisfied with it at all and you do not use the product in expectancy uh, negative disconfirmation of satisfaction what happens is that you it falls below the level of satisfaction that you have set for yourself or expectancy you still use the product and that is called negative disconfirmation. So, that is the difference and these are uh, some so within satisfaction we have the three types and this this is what is the negative disconfirmation with negative disconfirmation if certain products do not match what you wanted or do not the realization of the product does not match the expectation that you had with it. So, automatically it will be negative disconfirmation you do not like it right and so this negative disconfirmation leads to two things one is called contrast effect what happens is a wide negative disparity between expectation and actual performance customers tend to magnify the poor performance. So, when there is large negative disconfirmation if there is a large parity between actual realization and actual expectation if that is there then even the smallest possible thing is magnified by people when they when so, so suppose you bought a car and the car is not performing the way it should be and the smallest dent will be magnified with the highest possible say. So, when you are talking to someone describing that car you say that it is all dented everywhere whereas the car has only one small dent. But what has happened is since it is not expect it is not realized the car has not realized your expectation. So, you tend to exaggerate it effects and that is called the contrast effect and a similar as, uh, thing that is there is called the asymmetric effect and it is very similar to the prospect theory in decision making. What happens here is that a consumer experiences a certain level of negative disconfirmation with the performance of a particular attribute this has a greater impact on the dissatisfaction level then the same level of positive performance or the same attribute. So, once a particular attribute gives you dissatisfaction is does not match your particular expectation it is exaggerated more then if that particular attribute actually gave you an expectation actually gave you uh, a realization as expected. Now, remember prospect theory now in, in prospect theory what happens is that the gains that you get out of getting something the gains that you that that you get is not equivalent to the losses. So, losses are perceived with a higher slope losses are perceived as more sad losses are perceived as more uh, uh, negative than as gains and so this is an exact copy or it is basically an exact replica of what prospect theory says. So, those factors those attributes which actually discomforts which actually is not according to what you expected in a product those attributes which are not expect uh, which are not exactly of what you expected are tend to be perceived with a higher negative proportion than those products or those attributes when it is offering the same attribute when it is offering a positive chance or a positive variation. So, three kinds of performances any product when it gives satisfaction or dissatisfaction it is dependent on the performance of that product. So, this performance of the product can be of three types performance is ideal if a purchase perform if uh, if a purchase performs or better than expected. So, ideal performance is when you are looking for a product and that it performs the way you want it it is called an ideal performance. A performance is equitable if it is adequate for the cost and effort that the consumer has made to obtain it. 
So the every consumer when we buy a particular product, he he looks at the cost that he is going to spend, right? So the cost in terms of money, in terms of physical labor and all, and so he sums it up and he expects a certain realization for those costs. Now, if the realization is more than the cost, it is ideal, performance is ideal. If it is just equivalent to the cost, this is called performance is equitable and expected performance, the lowest level of satisfactory performance means that although the purchase works out as anticipated, it barely quantifies as satisfactory. So, it works for you, but it is not satisfactory, right. So, you bought a camera and uh, it was uh, a cheap camera and so you knew that it is not going to offer you the kind of things that you wanted, although you believe that it is going to offer you, but it just gave you certain kind of scratches, it is basically uh, an expected performance. In the performance equitable terms, so you bought, you wanted to buy a good camera, but you are not able to buy it, you buy a second hand camera, it has given you some scratches on top of uh, the photos, but the photos are very good or, ac or according to expectation that is called performance is equitable. An ideal performance, you bought a camera, it gives you the best possible output with additional features, the performance is ideal. So, what is the relationship between performance and satisfaction? Objective performance is service or product related. It depends upon whether the product or service meets all the functional benefits as expected. So, objective performance, the, 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 the relationship between performance and, and, and satisfaction is, is an objective performance occurs when the service or products related, uh, the, uh, service or product related is, it depends upon whether the product or service meets. So, on, on two different grounds, I can define this relationship, the relationship between performance and satisfaction on an objective scale and on an effective scale. So, the relationship between the performance of a product and the satisfaction one gets out of the performance of a product buying a particular product can be defined at the level of functionality, at the level of objectiveness or at the level of psychological variables, at the level of, psych, uh, psy, uh, at the level of feeling. So, in the terms of the, uh, in terms of the functionality, in terms of service or product related, uh, when a product or service meets the functional benefit as expected, it is said to have objective performance. But when a product or service which is meets the emotional benefits of someone, that is called, uh, that is called effective performance. And so, objective performance is dependent on the product or service, whereas the effective performance is dependent on something called consumers, right. And so, any product when you buy, it has to work on two levels. On one level, it has to give you objectivity, it has to give serve purposes for you, it has to serve functionality for you and in those cases, it and, and generally this is service related because it is product related thing. And so, when it meets your uh, demand and it functions for you, the way it is, you get satisfied with it and that is called the functional benefit or that is at the functional level, at the objective level, it has satisfied your need. On the other end, you are satisfied, you could also be satisfied uh, or at the effective level of a product, which is just consumer dependence and that is when the product not only gives you the functionality, but it also gives you something more than that, a positive feeling of acquiring it and that is called the functional aspect of a particular product. So, what can the marketers do to, what can the marketers do to increase this, uh, close the gap between expectation and performance? First thing, they can match the product benefit to consumer needs. Understand the consumer needs, what the consumer wants and match them to what uh, to their product benefits. So, they look at the product benefits, look at what the consumer wants, uh, wants and make this realization expectation equivalence. Otherwise, there is a little point in continuing with the marketing effort. So, at times what happens is you, you know that whatever you are offering that is not uh, worth what the consumer is wanting and once for example, let us look at high involvement product. So, if it is a very expensive car and uh, uh, low level consumer or I would not say low level, uh, uh, middle class consumer comes in to buy that, now his expectation will be very high or basically you cannot match it, uh, the expectation that he has with the whatever the car has. In those kinds of things, the, the marketers cannot do anything. But in all other cases, when the realization that he wants and the expectation that, he, that the consumer has and the realization the product offers is not matching or it is at least in on some level and there is a mismatch because of some reasons they can change that reason. So, product and how can they do that? By providing product information and communication to clearly describe not only what the benefits of the product is, but also the way in which it is to be used. So, telling what the product is, how it is to be used, uh, how it is to be serviced, what are the benefits out of it and so on and so forth and so marketers can do this to lower the gap between what? 
expectation that people have from a product and performance. And once this happens, there will be higher level of satisfaction and consumer will actually go ahead and buy the product over and over again. So, in this particular lecture, what we actually did was we looked at what is post purchase behavior or what is consumption and how does consumption progresses and what is the relation of this consumption to satisfaction and dissatisfaction and how consumption satisfaction and performance are related to each other. So, we basically defined the consumption process what, what does consumption really look like and out of the consumption process we looked at two different things one is satisfaction and one is dissatisfaction which is the output of any consumption. Now, in the next upcoming lecture which is lecture number 9 we will be dealing with the other end or the other part of it which is called cognitive dissonance. So, when a dissonance happens, what happens, how does it uh, move through and how consumption happens in terms of dissonance. So, we meet again until we meet again, it is thank you for here, thank you.